All right, here we are in 9.2, pre-calculus, talking about conic sections. The second of the conic sections that we're going to address is the hyperbola. The hyperbola has a definition, which is at the top of your screen there, and the graph below it is very helpful. We see that we have a center. Even though the center is not contained inside of our curves, it's between our curves, you could say. And we do still have foci with one inside of this curve. There's one inside of this curve. All right, so we've still got foci. And we do still have a distance from the center to a vertex. And these are going to be our vertices. And we see those more clearly at the bottom of the page. These are the equations of our two different hyperbolas. One you see is concave horizontally. One is concave vertically. We could also say concave left and right or concave up and down. I'll use those interchangeably. And you're seeing, again, focus, vertex, center. In this case, we are centered at the origin. That's going to change. We're going to get some H's and K's up in here in order to translate this thing around. Another big difference, well, there are some key differences between these equations for our possible hyperbolas and the equations that we saw for our ellipses or for an ellipse. One is this has a minus sign between the fractions. It's a big difference. So we're going to watch out for that as we try to identify if we're given an equation, how do I know which uh, conic section it matches up with? Well, a plus sign versus a minus sign between those fractions is going to be helpful. When we see this minus sign, and we know that we're working with a hyperbola, how do I know if it's going to open concave horizontal or concave vertical? If it leads with an x squared, then it's concave in the horizontal direction. It's cupped, you could say, in the horizontal direction. If, on the other hand, it leads with the y squared, leading with the y squared, there it is, then we see that the hyperbola is concave in the y direction. That's how I remember it, okay? Uh, there are other techniques, I'm sure, out there for memorizing this stuff or for developing your own pattern recognition. Another big difference is in the calculation of the distance from the center to a focus, c squared here equals a squared plus b squared. So I highlighted that entire equation, but most importantly, maybe, I should have highlighted the plus sign that's right in the middle. So watch out for that in your calculation of the distance from the center to the foci. All right, let's scroll down and look at some problems. This first equation, I see that it leads with an x squared, so it must be concave in the horizontal direction. However, this equation also must be concave in the hor horizontal direction. How do I know which one's which? Let's go back up. We must have missed one of the little patterns. Let's keep talking about these graphs. Let me get rid of some of this highlighting that's in our way. The distance in our right-hand graph from the center to a vertex is A. And A is the value under my y squared variable. Am I surprised? No because this distance of A is a vertical distance up to my vertex. Let's look at the graph that's to the left over here where I'm erasing. Let's see if that same pattern or same idea or method matches up. From the center of this graph, which happens to be at the origin, which it won't always be, what's that distance there? That's also being labeled as A, but this is in a horizontal direction. And look where the A value is. It's under the x squared. Well, that's interesting. Ah, it's possible. If 
for the x squared, oh, I'm circling y squared there, remember it's possible for the x squared to be the numerator of your first fraction or your second fraction. So it appears that whatever variable you're leading with, if it's the x squared, we said it was concave in the x or horizontal direction. Not only that, but the denominator underneath that x value is a horizontal distance from the center to a vertex. Here you're leading with a y squared, its denominator, a squared, b squared, q squared, I don't really care. The denominator that's under my y squared variable, the square root of it is the distance from the center to the vertex in the vertical or y direction. All right, I can point out every single one of these things, but it's gonna be best if we just see them in practice. So let's keep going down here. We're trying to notice as many of these patterns as possible. It's a lot. There are a lot of little nuances of these for sure. So many that I even missed one on the previous page. But here, we said that we're leading with x squared, so it's gotta be concave in the horizontal direction, which means it's one of these two graphs over here. We also see this four which means, I don't know if I'd really call it a horizontal radius, but the square root of four is two, and that's gonna be from the center to a vertex in the horizontal direction because it leads with an x squared. So we're seeing that distance of two right here. So this equation matches up with this graph. Right, that's a nightmare. If you've printed out these notes and you've just drawn everything that I have drawn, pause this video, erase all of that stuff. We're gonna have to figure out a different way to take notes on that. We should just be drawing lines and matching these things up. So pause, fix that, just draw yourself a line that goes from the first equation over to the last graph, and let's keep going. Okay, looking at the second equation, leads with an x squared, denominator is a one which means the horizontal, it's not a horizontal radius, but horizontally from the center to a vertex is a distance of one. Does that match? It sure does. Look at that distance of one right there. All right, here we are leading with a y squared, which means we're concave in the vertical direction. I see the denominator of four, square root of four is two, is the distance from the center to my vertex in the vertical direction, two units? Sure is. Does it work here? Absolutely. There's my distance of one vertically opens or concave in the y direction. Matching is fun, having the equations and having the graphs available. What if we have to do this for ourselves? Find the standard form of the equation of the hyperbola. I like to think of this from a sort of a fill in the blank perspective. I know it's either gonna lead with an x squared over something or a y squared over something. I don't know which one it is though. I don't know if it's concave in the vertical or horizontal direction. For that matter, I just thought of something else that we should have talked about way back here. Which is what? It's the location of the foci. I told you that the equation for finding the distance from the center to a focus was this one down here, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. But where are the foci relative to the center? The foci are c units from the center, but where are they? Well, notice in our diagrams, it's the better way to see it, that the foci are, I like to think of the foci as like a, a light bulb inside of a headlamp. So you've got this curved shape, and this is the headlight on your car, or on an older car maybe, depending on what kind of headlights you have, and there would be a bulb inside of there so that all of the light came shining out this way. Sort of like a satellite dish. Went too far. There we go. So the transverse axis, as it's called, I'm never gonna refer to this as the transverse axis. Okay, notice that it doesn't cross through the curve or through the hyperbola. Here's the transverse axis. Not a chance, never gonna say it. 
If you blindfolded me and told me to list everything that was on this page, transverse axis, never would have come up. But remembering that the focus has to be inside the curve. So if my curve is concave up, then my focus is definitely going to be above and below my center. We'll see if we can take that madness and apply it to this problem. Let's draw a quick graph. I've got foci uh, six below and six above the origin. Where should we draw? Let's draw over here. So I've got to go one, two, three, four, five, six above, one, two, three, four, five, six below. So I've got foci there. And I've got vertices two above and below. So for sure, our graph is going to look something like this because my curve as part of my headlight has to be wrapped around or concave around my focus. I've also drawn those sort of like they're parabolas cupping around the foci. That will not be the case. Uh, and we're going to see more t detailed graphs later. Find the standard form of the equation of the hyperbola. Okay, well, what information can we extract from this graph? A bunch of things. This is going to be the denominator under my y value. Or under y squared. We also know that this is going to be our c value. So that's 6. So y squared is going to be 2 squared. Our c value is going to be equal to 6. And then let's go ahead and do the quick calculation. c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. c squared, oops, we know what c is. It's 6. So we have 6 squared equals, does it matter whether a is 2 or b is 2? It sure doesn't because we're doing addition right here. So again, I don't focus ever on whether these denominators are a and b or b and a. Don't, I just, it's just not a focus of mine. No pun intended. Focus, see what I did there? So I'm just going to choose. Mm, let's have this one be the 2. And we'll square that plus b squared. I've got 36 minus 4, so that's 32. Do I need to take the square root of both sides? I don't. When I write my equation, am I going to be leading with x squared or y squared? Well, my graph is concave in the y direction, so I'm going to lead with y squared. My denominator under y squared is that vertical distance from my center to my vertex. We took a little note up here that said denominator under y squared was going to be 2 squared. So that's 2 squared, or you could put a 4 immediately. We know that the standard form for the hyperbola has a plus sign between our fractions. Our next numerator must by default be x squared. And the denominator under that is it's not a squared. We already used that one. So it must be b squared, which is 32. Standard form is also equal to 1. So either rewrite this thing with a 4 as your denominator or just back up and erase this and turn it into a 4 so that you can put a box around this as your final answer with no arrow. In 9.2, on the third page of these notes, we get more serious about graphing hyperbolas more accurately. And one of the things that's going to help us do that, at the bottom of the page, you see that there are asymptotes involved. I mentioned earlier that I was graphing them to look sort of like parabolas, but indeed they are not. The curves do follow those asymptotes. And in this first equation here, we see that we're leading with the x squared, which means we're concave in the x direction. And from the center to a vertex, so in the x direction, is this a value. 
and in the y direction i don't actually know where it is that i'm going in the y direction that's going to use utilize this b value i know that i use a and b together in order to determine the distance to the foci but what else am I going to be using that B value for in, in this graph? Well, we just said that from the center horizontally to a vertex is a distance of A. And what you're seeing depicted in this graph is that we've got a vertical distance B that's going up to the top of this box. And it's that box that's drawn in black dashed lines. It's that box and the diagonals that go through that box that create the asymptotes. So again, I'm not going to focus a lot on which denominator is which, except to make sure that I'm being sensitive to which direction I should be moving from the center as I draw my box. Much easier to talk about if we go and look at it with a specific example. So be aware that these very generalized statements are here and depictions of the asymptotes. In this problem, in order to work this one, we would have to complete the square first. Let's see on the next page, uh, we're into the parabola. Okay, so we do need to work this problem. Oh yes, this is page 404. So we're gonna round out this section by yet again completing the square. And there is a little bit of a difference in here, so I'm glad that we're gonna do this. Let's organize, should we put our x terms first or our y terms first? Well, what I'm seeing here is that this x term has a negative four in front of it. So I know from experience that that's gonna be my second fraction. In other words, it's my y terms that are gonna come first. Let's see this play out. I've got nine y squared minus 18y, then minus the 4x squared, plus 24x. I'm going to add the 63 over to the right-hand side. I'm really adding 63 to both sides of my equation so that it only appears on the right. And now we're going to do that somewhat unusual factoring maneuver. We're actually factoring twice times 2. I'm gonna factor a nine out of these first two terms. So I've got a y squared minus two y. And here's where I'm gonna leave that little bit of a blank space because I'm gonna add something in there. And I could put a plus sign in there. We, we talked about that we know it's gonna be positive because we're gonna divide by two and square. And then the next thing I'm gonna factor out is, oops, sorry about that, is a negative four. The negative 4 is coming away from the x squared so that we end up with a positive x squared in the parentheses, but when I factor out a negative 4 from this 24, it's going to turn into a negative 6x. And then we will add in <clears throat> that second unknown value. Now this turns out to be a negative 6 because, and we can double check our factoring, negative 4, if we distribute that, to the x squared, let me switch colors here, negative four times x squared would make negative four x squared, good. And then, more importantly, negative four times negative six x, the negative times negative would indeed make the positive 24 on the x. So being very careful, and that's one of the great reasons to practice this particular completing the square process is so that we make sure to address that issue of factoring out the negative. All right, and on the right hand side we are still equal to 63. Now we're going to do division by 2 and square, negative 2 divided by 2, quantity squared equals positive 1, negative 6 divided by 2, that's a 6, divided by 2 is negative 3, squared makes positive 9, so the 1 is going to get added in here, the 9 is going to get added in here, Ooh, I forgot, on the right-hand side over here, we've got to do some addition. We're going to add 9 times something, and that's from this 9 
distributed to this plus something. And then we also need to add, ooh, we're gonna subtract rather, four times something. And you already know where I'm going with it. It's minus four there. This is definitely still gonna be a plus sign, right? In fact, it turns out to be a plus nine. All right, let's fill in the blanks. Nine times y squared minus two y plus one minus four times x squared minus six x plus nine equals 63 plus nine times one minus four times nine. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that six or seven, seven times, times nine makes 63. So this is seven nines, and this is positive one nine, and this is take away four nines. So we have seven, and now we have eight nines, and then we take away four, eight minus four, that's only four nines. Well, that's equal to 36. Well, that's nice. Oh, look at this. Guess what nine times four is? 36. I love this. All right, so factoring. On the left-hand side, a couple of times, we designed those to factor very nicely. This turns into nine times y minus one quantity squared minus four times x minus three quantity squared. You could foil both of these out, y minus one times y minus one, or x minus three times x minus three, and confirm that they do in fact do equal those two previous quantities. On the right hand side, we said that this is equal to 36. Divide both sides by 36. And again, if you just wanna put in a little note here that you're dividing both sides by 36, that's how I like to do it and I get y minus one quantity squared over four after simplifying minus x minus three quantity squared over nine. 36 divided by itself is equal to one. Nice, so this is the equation of my hyperbola. I know that the, let's pick another color here. I know that the center is located at what we've called h comma k. In this case, that is, be careful, it's a positive one and a positive three. So it's the opposite of what both of these numbers look like they are. We're subtracting a positive one and we're subtracting a positive three. So that's where those come from, good. So we can plot that point. Let's go ahead and do that to the right one and up three, there we go, and which way is our hyperbola going to be concave? Since it leads with the y term, it's gonna be concave up. If you need to make those notes a little bit more uh, robust, if you need to write leads with the y term, therefore the graph is concave up, you can pause the video and make your notes a little bit more thorough. I'm gonna save a little space and just write concave up. I also know that the distance from the center to my vertex, both above and below, is a distance of two. So you could also come over here uh, on the left. We could write concave up. And we could say that this, or that this two is equal to the square root four, and it's this two that's gonna be the distance from the center to the vertex. So I'm gonna go up two units from my center, down two units from my center, and then remember that this B value, well, A value, B value, whatever it is, we're concave up, so our graph's gonna look something like this. Don't actually draw that yet, though, because we're gonna make that more accurate. In order to draw the dashed box through which we will draw our diagonal lines, which we're gonna become our asymptotes, uh, we need to make our rectangular box. 
So we've already gone up and down two units from the center. Now we're going to go three units, one, two, three units to the right from our vertex, one, two, three units to the left. I'm gonna go down to my other vertex, one, two, three units, one, two, three units. And maybe we could say, hopefully you're using pencil. I've gotta come in here Close this back up if I can. Oops. And three is equal to the square root of nine. And it's this distance right here that's my three. And this distance was the two. Now, as best you can, I usually, when I do this in person, I normally pull out like my, my ID or something, but if you've got something that you can grab and use as a straight edge, I'm at home so my wallet's not in my pocket. Let's see, this, this ought to work. It's like a gift card that I found laying here. Let me see if with my digital pen I can still do this. Yeah, that'll work. So I'm drawing my dashed line so that it passes through my center and through the corners of the box that I just drew using the square root of my two denominators, square root of four and the square root of nine. And these are my asymptotes. And now we can, now if you are using multiple colors or if you're not using multiple colors, if you're just using pencil, if you wanted to sketch this curve using a pencil and then come in on top of it with a different color, our curve is going to pass through this vertex and then it's going to slide out here and just cruise along that asymptote with a little arrow on the end of it. And we're doing the same thing off to the left. It's staying pretty low. This thing's pretty wide. Unlike most of the parabolas that we grew up graphing, you know, we, normally we would see a parabola would be pretty narrow like this, but the hyperbola that we're drawing is quite wide. And then we get another one down below. Again, make sure that it's coming right out of that vertex and that it doesn't actually end up touching your asymptotes. The smaller this distance is compared to the horizontal distance, the more these uh, asymptotes are going to be flattened and the wider your asymptotes gonna, or your uh, curve is going to be. So I'm not super surprised that these hyperbolas are pretty wide. There are a couple of things that we have not yet calculated. Really? This is a long problem. There's a lot of different things going on in here. If that's what you're thinking, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're like, I don't even know, 14 minutes into this or something. Uh, we have not yet calculated the distance from the center to the foci. So let's talk about foci. I know that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared when I'm working with hyperbolas. My a squared value and b squared value, I don't care which ones they are. You could do 4 plus 9 and get 13. You could do 9 plus 4 and get 13. Either way, your c value is going to be the square root of 13. What's the square root of 13? I don't know. The square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 4 or 16 is 4. 13 is somewhere between 9 and 16, so it's somewhere between 3 and 4. Maybe it's three and a half. What's 3.5 squared? Three times four is 12, so 12.5, 12.25. It's a little bit short of 13, so a little bit more than 3.5. Maybe it's 3.6. So what that tells me is that above and below my center, because my foci have to end up inside my curves, I'm going to start at my center. So I've got my pencil pointing at the center where the two diagonal lines meet. And I'm going up one, two, three, and a little bit more. You 
can grab a four function calculator and figure out the square root of 13 and get that number more accurately, but for the purposes of this sketch, a little bit more than three and a half is gonna serve us just fine. So that's the first focus. And you could label it with an F or something, or F1 if you want. Then I'm gonna come back to my center, I'm gonna count down one, two, three, a little bit more than three and a half down. That's gonna be another focus. And what are the coordinates of my foci? The x-coordinate of both foci is the same as the x-coordinate of my center, which is positive one. And from the center, which had a y-coordinate of three, I went up and down the square root of 13 in order to get to my foci. What, and remember that when you're typing this into online software, you might have to type that in as two separate pairs of coordinates uh, separated by a comma. The only other thing we haven't talked about is the actual equations for the asymptotes. In order to write the equation of a line, you're going to need a point and you're going to need a slope. Thankfully, both of those things are readily available. I'm going to grab, I think, a different color here. Let's use, uh, let's try this, see what this looks like. Let's look at our asymptotes next. I'm going to use point slope form, y minus y1 equals our slope m times x minus x1. And since this asymptote is pointing right at our work here. Let's figure out the equation for that line. I'm going to use my center as x1 comma y1 for the creation of both of these equations for my asymptotes. And I know what the slope of this diagonal line is. And remember that we're working with this one. So it's going to have a negative slope. If we start at the center again, and we think about rise over run, I'm going up two units, and I'm running to the left three units in order to get to another point that's on that diagonal line. So I'm still using rise over run. Let's start plugging stuff in. I've got y minus my y1 value, the y coordinate of my center, that's three, equals our slope. We said we're going up two units, we're going left three units, so be careful. There's a, an equal sign and the division symbol and the negative, so it's two over negative three or negative two thirds times x minus the x coordinate of our center was one. There's not a whole lot of cleaning up of this equation that we could do except for getting rid of some parentheses. You could distribute and solve for y in order to turn this into y equals mx plus b, which is slope intercept form. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to assume that if you've made it to pre-calc that you can handle that maneuver. Maybe I'll write this as negative two thirds times x minus one. I'll put a box around that as one of the equations of my asymptotes. Sometimes these asymptotes are going to be labeled like L1 and L2. So this is only one of them. You'll have to go through the same process. Your slope, however, is going to be positive with the same x1, y1 in order to find the equation for your other asymptote. Wow, more than any one person should ever know about hyperbolas. Maybe you didn't know anything about hyperbolas before this. There's a lot of colors. There's a lot going on in here, I know. Take it slow, rewrite these notes, maybe get, consider getting some different colored writing utensils or different colored highlighters or something. Maybe print this page out twice and spend one of those pages just looking at the completing the square process. And then use the second copy of this page to examine concavity, the center, the foci, the process of drawing those uh, asymptotes, and then actually finding out the equations for those asymptotes. Because really, all of the stuff that I did down here 
if I had had this space up here in order to do some arithmetic and stuff, this would have looked a lot more organized. So maybe print out two copies of this page and spread your work out a little bit or do it on a separate sheet of paper. I sure hope that this was helpful and I look forward to talking to you again in 9.3 where we're going to look at the parabola. Later.